For those of you who attended last year's conference, you recall my presentation on electric geology looking specifically at what I call scarred granite, with my conclusion that the dikes I found in the granite and had documented were created on the surface rather than deep below as mainstream science tells us today. The first section of this presentation reveals more about what I found on the granite as I returned to this area last summer and explored some of it further. For those of you who are observer subscribers, you will know me as a regular fly-on-the-wall contributor, although I am sometimes just a silent fly myself. <laughs> for the last several years, I've been a volunteer co-producer for Guns and Butter, a show with more than 15 years of exposing the truth. I had the privilege and honor of interviewing Michael Steinbacher about two years ago, which launched me into my own exploration of electric geology. More on this later in the presentation. A few years ago, I authored a three-part series titled Skyception covering the various aspects of the aerosol programs, one of the only pieces published to date covering the intersection of space, weather, and aerosols. For my day job, I manage a large outdoor travel program, which has become relevant to my other interests, as many of the places I, we run trips have some really amazing geology to explore. Much of my direct experience in the field is a result of my opportunities through work. In last year's presentation, I showed a number of photos of an area of the High Sierra just north of Yosemite National Park that I had stumbled upon while backpacking with a friend and revealed what appeared to be a Lichtenberg effect upon the granite for miles around a certain area. I also presented studies showing how lightning can actually transmute rocks and change their fundamental structure. I returned to this area last August to explore it and understand it further. I found some amazing features, such as this one showing perfect right angles or others that go down boulders, seeming to just graze the surface in some places. Ben asked me to describe what that red thing is, and it's a water bottle about this size. So you can see how, how big that piece of uh, quartz is in, in the granite there. Before moving on, let's resume, resume, review some mainstream geology conclusions. Granite, an igneous rock, was formed deep underground requiring heat and pressure to create molten rock material and its slow cooling creates the crystalline structures of granite and similar material. This granite is then separated, fractured, cracked, allowing material to flow in, form these, undergrad, form these dikes, mainly made of feldspar, mica, and quartz. Over the next millions of years, these underground formations slowly rose, rotated, while ice, wind, and water carved and sculpt and exposed to what we see today. On my day hike of the area, I came across one dike that stretched on for some distance. The left photo looks up from my point, while the right looks down the canyon towards the pond. I followed this dike along for a long time, eventually reaching the pond as seen in the first slide, the right bottom slide there. Crossing it and following it further, the dike continues down the canyon. I followed this dike for almost a mile, seeing that it continued higher than my starting point and continuing down the canyon with the width of it never changing. The only observable difference was in some places it seemed to be etched on rather than a deep vein. And it actually looked like a, a, someone had taken a uh, marker from a, a field and just kind of walked along and painted along. It was that per precise and, and, and perfect in its, in its um, width. These are two interesting things I came across. The photo on the left shows that the veins were created after this concrete-like material, which is no more than an inch or two thick, was deposited on top of the granite. There were many of these patches around randomly distributed over the area I hiked. As you can see from the photo on the right, it appears that this was viscous, seeming to actually flow down the granite. Both of these images pose some difficult challenges for the mainstream theory of vein formation and concrete-like material that seems to be out of place on top of the granite, especially since the granite was supposedly carved by glaciers many millennia ago. I think the theory I posed last year makes more sense and one that doesn't require events that are not logical, such as magical elevators and selective glacial carving to expose this rock. Instead, I am suggesting these veins were created in place by a massive direct electrical plasma strike that was large enough to cause a transmutation of the granite into quartz for miles around where the strike occurred. I thought it was important to spend a little time to revisit this one lens as it offers some direct observational evidence that easily challenges the mainstream scientific viewpoint and shows us the true power of electricity. Andrew Hall has developed some interesting theories introduced last year at the Thunderbolts Electric Universe Conference. He's trying to demonstrate how arc blasts can create certain types of formations and mountains. While I think he might be missing some other ways the electricity can create geological formations, as I was showing you, he does bring up a key point I want to share with you as it will be important later on. 
The concept that an electric field can ionize particles and material while a magnetic field will sort them is an important one. Andres Otto also presented at last year's Electric Universe Conference and discussed how electric discharge machining, or EDM, can carve planetary bodies due to the electrical interaction. Billy Yel Yelverton has shown us this in the lab. The first video showed arc discharge. The last two videos showed EDM in cold or dark plasma mode. As you can see in this video, vibrations can have a dramatic effect, creating many types of mountain formations. It is not difficult to imagine that if there were planetary electrical discharges, there would likely be significant and sustained shaking of the ground and the surrounding environment. The next set of videos from Billy's lab, we'll see how different vibrational frequencies would impact and create different mountain formations. In my interview with Michael Steinbacher two years ago, he talked about how he had been exploring some of the research that had been done by the Colorado State University and some of the conclusions they reached. The image on top shows how stratification of different types of material can occur when combined and poured through a funnel. The image below shows stratification that occurred when using the force of water, simulating a large moving flood of waters. They also found that different volumes of water as well as the intensity of force used created different stratification layers and densities. This mainstream research is even challenging current evolutionary theories with some of their findings. While the stratification process may not explain many of the geological features we see today, it does provide another possible piece of the puzzle. I do know that Michael Steinbacher was focused on the role of water and how it may have helped in creating these formations, as we will see next, and that, as well as the role that electricity or plasma environments play in creating mountains. This will be a control test in the uh, Michael Steinbacher series. We will run the water and allow the material to fall but we won't use any electricity and just to give us an idea of what happens. As Billy had mentioned, he was doing some experiments at the request of Michael using flowing water and material falling from above, as quoted from our interview. From my perspective, I think this direction Michael was pursuing will be one of his greatest contributions to this research and theory development. As you see in the control experiment, there's little to no buildup of material next to the water. 
Now we'll see once it's done, we'll see what happens when we do an electrical environment. What we just saw was how material deposited from above in this dark plasma mode is that the materials builds in specific areas along the water while preventing accumulation where the water flows. This means that enough material, mountains can literally grow around the water, creating many of the features that we see. Billy's video was about 15 minutes that I ran in just over a minute and shows that mountains could have been created in hours or days. Mainstream science tells us today that these features are created over millions of years with wind and water alone. This is something Michael mentioned a number of times. The timeline he was theorizing was not reconcilable with mainstream science. There was no middle ground between the two theories. The video show, shown was only one type of material. However, other videos from Billy's experiments and what I showed earlier from Andrew Hall's research is that an electromagnetic environment can ionize and sort material, sort like material, giving us another way to create stratification or layering. Shortly after interviewing Mike in June of 2015, I began rereading Emanuel Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision, as I learned so much since I'd first read it three years prior. After Michael's passing in July, I took a raft trip down the Green River through Dinosaur National Monument in northeastern Utah while reading this book and having our interview on my mind, as some things stood out from it. Michael emphasized the role of the Great Flood and the enormous amount of material that fell from the sky for days, as Velikovsky describes, for many cultures around the world. After the dust came down, hot gravel, stones of fire, and then naphtha, or rivers of fire, as Michael called it, it, fell from the sky. It could have just been a liquid like oil, or possibly as more like molten lot like lava. The latter might help explain geologic anomalies like that mainstream science cannot explain with rationality, like the Columbia River Gorge or other large basalt deposits. With a new lens to look at mountain building on my four-day raft trip and having seen it actually happen in the lab, I can imagine how many of the features could be created with the right type and amount of material in an electric environment. On a side note, I did share some of my insights with some of the others on the trip, but they weren't having any of it and were set on the millions of years with wind and water erosion theory. While I didn't get to experience any of the excitement I had in better understanding mountain building, I could not yet explain some of these features in the next images. The experiments earlier showed material being deposited as cliffs along the water in various formations, but they were relatively flat and uniform away from the flowing channel of water. You didn't get this terracing that you see in these images. Can you guys all see kind of how it's terraced lower down below? Is that clear enough for you? I can point to it if you kind of... So it's, it's kind of terraced here. You can kind of see it goes up in blocks in these sections before it reaches some of the high cliffs. So it looks like it's been stepped back is so, sort of what I mean by the terracing. And you'll see it in different formations. So the one on the upper right, these are um, probably 100 feet up from this amount to up here. So on this side from about up here to up here. And it's stepped back, so it's terraced. So it looks like there's large sections of blocks and then go back further, more large sections of blocks. So it looks like there were... Um, steps created 10 foot, 20 foot, depending on the section that you're going to see. And each of the terracing is a little bit different in the different formations. The only way to get, the only way to get it would be to have different water levels while the material was coming down. If it was rising, you would expect it to terrace in this manner. 
The accumulation of materia would build in blocks like we saw in the video, but as water rose, it would overcome that section, preventing further accumulation on it, and the water would flow temporarily and stop at the next block of material. This would continue with water rising and mountain building, creating layering or terracing until the water stopped rising. Add in different materials and you would expect terrace stratification or layering. Michael did a number of videos about the great flood that Velikovsky writes about. Whether it was Venus stopping the Earth or some other planetary disruption, something caused thousands of feet of water to rush towards the poles, creating tidal waves across the continents. Velikovsky's second book, Earth in Upheaval, does an excellent job detailing this event or events. These are some more photos from above looking at the same kind of layering. You can see a little bit different um, with this perspective. In these two slides on top, these are large sandstone deposits that begin their shear cliffs at the top, likely top of the water line, where the sedimentation begins. When the water receded, it left significant sediment deposits along the way, giving more clues to this great flood or floods. The reason I use the plural is that we don't know how many events there were and which formations each created. We do know that many native cultures hold geological features as holy places and claim that they were created by the hand of God. They might not be so far off from what took place, certainly much closer to reality than mainstream science today. I recently moved to the Columbia River Gorge and have found more evidence of this terrace layering, but this time with basalt rather than limestone and sandstone that we saw in the Green River slides. The Columbia River Basalt Group covers more than 210,000 square kilometers of the northwest U.S., and in some areas up to 1,000 meters thick. According to mainstream science, this basalt group was formed in more than 350 lava flows from 5.5 to 16.7 million years ago. They also found evidence of magnetic reversals, but were only dated at the start of the formation of this group. In the USGS article I reference, they have some interesting descriptions on timing, volume, and location of these flows. I did find this quote from the article most important and should be telling for many observers in the audience. Quote from the article. Columbia River basalt group flows have interesting textural characteristics. Units often have a flow top, a dense interior, and a flow bottom. The flow interiors can form regular patterns or styles during cooling, including columnar blocky jointing. This texture is often called columnar basalt and consists mostly of vertically oriented polygonal columns that can range from about a half a meter to greater than three meters in diameter. If columnar basalt is viewed from atop, the pattern looks like a beehive. There are challenges to this mainstream theory with observations and facts that scientists find difficult to reconcile. One interesting one I found in Velikovsky's Earth and Upheaval. He documents a find in 1889 where a small figurine was found at a depth of 320 feet during a well dig near the Snake River in Idaho, passing through a sheet of basalt 15 feet thick. Rather difficult if this was from lava flow millions of years ago. As you can see from these slides, the same pattern of terrace layers occurs. Mainstream science tells us this, that this formed at the end of the last ice age from the massive Missoula floods that carved and cut through the basalt. What you see on the opposite side of the river has the same terracing on the side I was hiking on. They each have similar depth, patterns, um, layering, and terracing, so you can look across and basically see the same sort of patterns on the opposite side of the river. This is not likely from a massive flood to carve it, not to mention that basalt is one of the harder substances to cut. It does not erode like sandstone or other similar types of rocks. I would concur there was a great flood. However, I believe it's coming from the other direction as the basalt was being laid down as molten material in an electrical plasma environment, creating the patterns we saw in the last video, column-type structures. As the water level rose, it created terrace layering with even layers on both sides of the rising water and the water rapidly cooling the material once it was submerged. Finally, as I close this presentation, I'll leave you with these resources. Hopefully, some of these possible and alternative ways of creating geological features will give you some new lenses to view them and see which ones were more dominant in the creation of the formations. I want to thank you all for your time, Ben, for giving me the opportunity to share this work with you, and for Kat for arranging this all. Appreciate it. Can we all thank him again for basically recognizing, like so many of us did, uh, how important Michael Steinbacher's work was and the fact that it's still alive now? Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs>